Hi class, in this video we're going to be going over what two force numbers are. The accompanying reading for this in our textbook is chapter 5.4.2. The learning objectives for this lecture, by the end of this, you should be able to define what a two force member is. You should be able to define what assumptions are required to call a member a two force member and you should be able to identify all two force members within subsystems. We will begin with the first learning objective and that is defining what is a two force member. So take a second and think to yourself what that might be. So a two force member is any body or system that has only two forces acting on it and specifically at two distinct points. So it's just like it sounds. It's a body with two force or a member with two forces and specifically acting only at two distinct points. Another um, requisite for a body to be a two force member is that there are no force couples or torques acting on that body. When we identify a member as being a two force member, there are some assumptions that are accompanying that that go along with the two force member assumptions. The assumptions that must be made to call a member a two force member are that the system is a rigid body and it's in equilibrium. Additionally, that the forces, like we said, are acting only at a point. So they are point loads. And then this may be sort of redundant, but that usually the body is a massless body. Um, and if there are two other forces acting on a body, then the weight, then this uh, assumption can be concluded from that. But we must assume that the body is massless. So let's take a look at our first example of doing equilibrium analysis on a two force member. Suppose we had a physical situation where we had a link uh, connected by two pins. So a frictionless pin at A and B. We can also assume, or we're assuming that this member AB is massless, that it's a rigid body, and then the system is in equilibrium. Once we've identified a subsystem, and we'll continue to learn about subsystems, but we can identify the system as the member, just the member AB. So we'd like to do a free body diagram of this and then determine the forces acting upon it. And so since we've modeled this as a frictionless pin at A and B, um, and right here I've shown a basis uh, where the x-axis is going along the direction of member AB, and then the y-axis is acting perpendicular to member AB. We can draw our reactions uh, at B as a pin connection. So it would resist actions in the y direction, so with a force, and it would re resist actions in the x direction with a force RBX. Similarly, we can put a model of a pin connection at point A. Since we've assumed that the body is massless, we will not put in a weight of a member AB. So this is all external forces acting on AB as the system according to the assumptions that we've made about member AB. And what we see here is that we'd have uh, reactions acting at two points. And so what we'd like to do uh, is take the vector sum of all moments uh, about point A. And just a quick aside, this would count as a two force member because while there are two distinct components, maybe RBX and RBY, those are a vector sum of one force acting at B. So forces are applied at two distinct points. It's okay if they have different vector components because those vector components would add up to a single force. So we could have some RA vector and some RV, RB vector. Okay, so using equilibrium, uh, we could take the vector set of all uh, moments acting about point A on the system, and we know that's equal to the zero vector according to equilibrium. Uh, and so if we think about what forces create a moment about A, we have the moment from RB acting about A, and then what other moments acting about A? Well, 
it turns out RA, since it's at A, won't contribute to the moment about A. And then RBX, since it's along the line of action towards A, would be a zero moment. So this is all of the moments, non-zero moments, acting at A. And so let's go ahead and plug in our vector equation. We know that this would be equal to L times RBY. So the magnitude L times the magnitude of RBY. And then using the right-hand rule, we know that this is a z-hat moment. So curl your fingers, um, point them out from A towards RBY, curl them in the direction of RBY, and they should be pointing in the z-hat direction. And using the dot product to solve for the scalar equation, what we see here is since L is not zero and Z is non-zero, the only way that this would be the zero vector is if RBY is the zero scalar. So we have just determined that RBY must be zero. We can also take the sum of all forces acting on the system, the vector sum of all forces acting on the system in the AY or in the Y direction to find RAY. So dotting the resultant set of forces on the system with the Y direction would give us zero, the scalar, and that would give us the components acting in the Y direction. So that would be RAY and also RBY acts in the Y hat direction. What you might be seeing right now is that what we just said and we determined using the resultant set of moments about A, that RBY is zero. Therefore, RAY must be zero. And so what conclusion can we make from our analysis so far? So if we think about this, what we found is that RBY and RAY, so the reactions at A in the Y direction, the reactions at B in the Y direction, are zero. And if we think about this, what this is, is there's some huge implications here. What is the implication? Well, the implication is that there can be no component of the force that is perpendicular to a line of action from A to B. So we haven't solved for the X components, but what we have solved is that there is no component of the force acting on our two force member that is not along the line of action. So that's a startling conclusion. So for any body that's in equilibrium and that only has two forces acting at a point, those forces must act along the line of action between the points of application. And so this is what all two force members have in common, is that if there are forces applied only at two distinct points, there can only be forces that are along the line of action between those points and no component of the force acting not along that line of action. So this is the conclusion we can make using equilibrium and our free body diagram. So let's take a look at just a general body. This could be any system. We always kind of do these systems as this lima beam shape. But let's post our conclusion that we just made about two force members. And that is if a uh, member has forces acting at two points and it's in equilibrium, those forces must be directed along a line of action between those points. And let's just say we had a blob here and we called this blob a massless blob, and we knew that there were forces applied at point A and at point B. What we would know is that those forces must be directed along a line of action between points A and B, if this is truly a two-force member. And so one uh, way we could think about this is potentially there could be a force directed uh, out from A along the line of action from A to B. One note on the way I like to do notations for two force members is that always I like to denote F or maybe even T, but denote the two points uh, that the line of action is going along. So the notation here is that this is a force acting at A. So I like to put A as the first letter and then B is the second letter because that's the 
the second point that the line of action is uh, along. So first I put FA because F is acting at point A. And then secondly, I would put B because B is the other point on this two force numbers line of action. And if there's a force pulling along uh, up at A and the system is in equilibrium, we know that there's really only one other option for the force at B. It can't be going up. So we can direct that down along this line of action. And in this case, we would say this is F B A. That's because this is the force acting at point B. Still, the line of action is directed from B to A. So that's just one note. Something along this line is how you should denote two force members, giving both points where the line of action is directed along. OK. Well, is this the only possible solution? Uh, it, it turns out it is not. What we can see here is since FAB is pulling up and FBA is pulling sort of down and to the left, what we would say is that this member is being stretched out. Or an engineering term that we like to use is that this member, this two force member, is in tension. So this is like a tensile load. It is pulling it apart. If a, system, if a body is in tension, it's being stretched out. But there's another option. So um, let's say we have that same system. It could also be that FAB is directed downwards and push, pushing down towards point B. And then from equilibrium, if the system was going to be in equilibrium, we would know that FBA must be directed upwards. And what you could see is these two forces have the effect of squeezing the system together. And so the engineering term that we like to use for that, if a system is being squished, would be that this two force member is in compression. So this is a compressive load here. And so if we have a body with only two forces being applied on it, we know the line of action of those forces, but we don't know if that member is in tension or in compression. So it may be either in tension or compression. One caveat is if our body, if our system is a cable, we know that cables can only be in tension. So that's sort of the only um, caveat to this is if you have a cable that could actually, a massless cable can be considered as a two force member, uh, that will only be in tension. So now that we know what two force members are, and if we have a two force member, which direction the force will be acting along or what line of action those forces would be acting along, let's practice identifying two force members within systems. So first, I'd like you to take a look at this system and circle any members that are two force members. And then once you have identified that, then go ahead and draw a free body diagram. So maybe pause the video here and do that. Okay, hopefully you've given yourself a chance to work on this. The members are solid members. So to identify a member, it must be a continuous member. And then, so we wouldn't have a continuous member A, B, C, because there is a link, a little pin here. That's what's identified by this little picture. We see this little dot here. That means that there is a pin connection connecting the link A, B to the link C, B. So if we have a pin connection here, let's take a look at member AB, identifying that as only one single member. Is this a two force member? Well, if there's a pin connection at A and a pin connection at B, there must be forces at A and B. So in order for this to be a two force member, those would be the only forces, only two points of application of forces. What we see is there's a third point of application for a force, meaning this is a three force member. So it is not a two force member. If we look at this continuous member from C to B, that is pinned to member AB, so we could call this member BC, we see that there are two points of force applications, the pin connection at C and then the pin connection at B. 
So this would qualify as a two-force member. And a free body diagram of this two-force member, we would have a forces directed along the line of action from C to B. Now here I have guessed that the member is in compression, but it may be that the member is in tension. So this is an unknown. It's, we don't know the magnitude, and we don't know if it's either in compression or tension. Um, it's okay to draw them in one or the other. When you do equilibrium, you will find out that if it's in tension or compression. Let's take a look at another example. So maybe pause the video here and identify the two force members and draw your free body diagram. Okay, hopefully you've given yourself a chance to do that. Let's take a look at the first continuous member, the member from A all the way down to B. We see that there's a pin connection at A and a pin connection at B, and then there's a force applied uh, at one meter from A. This means that there's one, two, three points of application for forces. So this would not qualify as a two force member. Let's focus in on the member down here that's connected from C to B. This member has two pin connections. Therefore, it is a two force member. However, one thing that I find often students mistake is what the resultant forces are acting along this. I find that oftentimes when students draw free body diagrams, they would draw a force straight down from C and a force straight to the right from B. But that does not reflect the reality with a two force member. Recall what we know about two force members is that the resultant forces must act along a line of action between the two points of line of action. So that would violate the physics that we know of how two force members react. So a correct free body diagram would have forces directed along the lines of action from C to B. It would not have forces pointing straight down because that would have a component of the force not along the line of action, and that would violate the physics of this being in equilibrium. Now this is shown as being squished, but it could also be directed the other way, and equilibrium would determine that. Let's take a look at another system again. So go ahead and identify any two force members here. Now that you've given yourself a chance to do that and draw the free body diagrams, we take a look at A, B, C. Now this is somewhat confusing, but what you see here is this: there's not a break in this. this there's a cable connected at B to D, but this is actually one solid beam. And we know this couldn't possibly be a pin connection at B, because if it was, member BC would have no resistance to moment and it would just spin down. So this must be a solid continuous member from A to B to C. And there are three points of applications in members A, B, C. There's a pin connection at A, a tension force at B, and another tension force at C, meaning there are three forces and this would not qualify as a two force member. And so it would be okay to just say this is the only two, there are no two force members here. We could sort of consider the cable, if we just looked at the cable from D to B or B to D as being a two force member. And so that would look like the cable. And then we know cables can only be in tension. So we would have forces acting along the direction of the cable, pulling it in tension. And then you could also think about the mass here. And this is kind of a, an interesting scenario of it, but it's we could have the mass with just the weight acting at its center of mass, and then the string, the tension load, acting at the point of application. So effectively, there could be only two forces acting on this mass system. And we would have the tension, and that would have to be equal and opposite to the weight of that mass. What is important here is that the center of mass will always go in line with the tension. 
And we'll come back to this a little bit later when we derive where the center of mass exists. Let's take a look at another example here. So go ahead and give yourself a second or two, a minute or two, to identify all the two force members in this system, and then draw the free body diagrams. Okay, so now that you've done that, let's take a look at member A, C. Now there's a pin and slot connection here, is how we could model this, being connected to a solid beam from B to C to D to E. So there's one solid member here. If we focus in on member A, C, what we see would be there would be one point of application for a force at A, a pin connection at A, and then another single point of application at C where we have a pin connection. So would this qualify as a two force member? Because we could think of this as only having forces at two points of application. And here is the problem, is that remember, there can be no torques applied to a two force member. So because there is a moment uh, or a force couple applied at A that is 200 Newton meters, this would invalidate this from being a two force member. So member AC is not a two force member. We can also think about this is that we know force couples result from forces being separated by a distance. So two equal and opposite forces being separated by a distance. So there's no way that that force could act exactly at one point. There would have to be some spatial separation, meaning that there wouldn't be only point A and only point C uh, points of application for forces. So this would not be a two force member. Anytime you see an external moment or torque force couple applied to a member, then it automatically is disqualified from being a two force member. Looking at member B, C, D, E, we see that there are four points of application, so this is clearly not a two-force member. So we do not have any two-force members acting in the system. Let's take a look at another system here. So take a minute and identify the two-force members and draw your free body diagrams. Okay, so now that you've paused the video and given yourself some time to do that, we can look at member A, B, but also see that it's a continuous member going from C to A to B. It would have to be continuous because if it was just pinned to member CA and if AB was distinct from member CA, that member would have no resistance to rotation and would be spinning. So if the system is in equilibrium, this must be a continuous member from C to A to B. So this is one member here. And that one member has one to three points of application for forces. Therefore, this cannot be a two force member. However, we see member AC only has a pin connection at C and A. And if we assume that this is massless, which was a given assumption, um, and the pins are frictionless, meaning that they can't exert a torque, then we would have a two force member where the forces are acting along a line of action from A to C. Here I have chosen to put that member in tension, but equilibrium may show that this could be in compression. So this is still yet to be determined. We also have member BD, which is also a two force member, only two points of application at B, the pin connection at B and the pin connection at D. And this is what the free body diagram of that two force member would be. An important thing is that we never split up the reactions. So unlike most pin connections, like we might say RAX, RAX, and RAY, we do not do that when we have pin connections for members that we have identified as a two force member because we know the way the force must be directed. It must be directed along a line of action from the two points of application. So in this video, we've covered what two force members are what that means for how the forces will act on the two force member, and then how to identify two force members within larger systems. Hopefully you found this video useful and you have learned a lot about two force members.